seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Imis este do alas is yis, e ante do alas morantri, en tini alis thisete, is uden is hii, eti i mi vlithen exo catapatiste ipo ton anthropon. Imis este to fos tu cosmo, udinate polis griveni, epano orus kimen, ude ke eusum lignon ke ti theasin afton ipo ton modium, ala epi ti lignian ke lampi passin tis en ti ikia. Utos lampsato to fos simon en prosten ton anthropon, opos idiosin imon takala erga ke oxasosin ton patera imon ton entis uranis. Picture the scene. They're seated on the ground. Behind them, the, the crowds are, are leaning in, wanting to hear what is said. The teacher begins to speak. And he says to them, You, you are the salt of the earth. And he says, You, you are the light of the world. You're a city on a hill that can't be hidden. And as you picture the scene and you look at this group of Jewish peasants, no power, no education, no social status, no money, you, you, you look to the teacher to see the smile on his face. It's, he's just having a joke. But as you look at Jesus, you see that his gaze is steadfast. His face is unsmiling. He's serious. You are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, the city on a hill that can't be hidden. Well, last week, uh, if you joined us, you know that we began this Sermon on the Mount series by looking at the Beatitudes, the, the first verses where Jesus says, blessed, happy are you, happy are you. And he, and he speaks to his people. He speaks to Christians and he says, this is what it is to be a Christian in the world. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted. These blessedness. But now, in these next verses, in 13 to 16, Jesus then answers what is a fundamental question to those group who were sitting before him on the mount listening to his teaching, and which is a, and continues to be a fundamental question for each one of us right now this morning. Not so much who you are as a Christian, that was last week. Jesus now asks, what does it look like to be a Christian in the world in which you live? What is the relationship of God's people, the church, to the world out there? What does it look like to be a Christian in the world in which you live? There's not a single person who is a Christian who hasn't wrestled with that at some time in their lives. In fact, we wrestle with it every week. What does it look like for me, a Christian, here on Sunday, gathered with God's people, what does it look like for me to go out into the world during the week? Because there's, not a, there's a multiple answers to that. It, it could look like I'm going to try and remain as untainted by this world as I can until I can get back in my holy huddle with the other Christians where I can be safe. Or it might be, well, look, no, I'm just going to be like the chameleon, I'm one color on Sundays in church, but when I go out into that world, I change the color to resemble those around me. I'm going to fly under the radar as a Christian. I'm, I'm going to be quietly doing my own thing in my private space. Or you could say, no, I'm going to become the moral police. I'm going to go out into that world with my baton and I'm going to beat people who are not living according to the standards that Christ speaks of. Now, I've probably... 
over-accentuated each of those views. But there are Christians who answer that question, what does it look like, with that same answers. But let's think personally, what does it look like for you right now to live in this world as a Christian? And if you're not a Christian and you're one of the crowd looking in as Jesus teaches his disciples, then, then you're asking the question, well, what should it look like for these Christians to live in my world? Or maybe you're asking yourself, what would it be like if I was a Christian myself living in my world? So how do you relate to the world? How do you live? Well, to answer that question, as he teaches these small group of Jewish peasants, Jesus uses two images, images that were familiar to every single person that would have heard him speak, uh, commodities that were present in every single home in the first century, and commodities that we are still very familiar with today. He uses salt, and he uses light. So let's look at them in turn. Firstly, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. Um, Last year in March, COVID was just beginning to dawn on the horizon, and uh, I was having a chat with my neighbor over our back fence. And we were chatting about it. He happens to be a doctor, and he said to me, um, well, look, this COVID thing might last until September. And I was like, yeah, right. (laughs) Let's think worst case, September. But then uh, as he was chatting, we were were laughing about the people stockpiling toilet paper. And uh, and he said, no, 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 they're stockpiling the wrong thing. You know, you can can use your hand with toilet paper. You don't need toilet paper. What you need, he said, is salt. And I'm like, what do you mean? And and, and I knew he'd been um, a refugee during uh, the the Bosnian civil war in the 1990s. And he said, yeah, when we were in Bosnia, when when we were were living in the forest, we discovered that you could live on rotten potatoes and grass, but you could not live without salt. Salt was totally essential. He said, you need to stock up on salt. And so forget the toilet paper, we stocked up on salt to go with our grass, to, so we could you know, put it on our lawn. And uh, so yesterday, I hope, as, as apparently toilet paper's gone again. I can, can you believe it? But apparently the, the shelves are getting stripped. Forget the toilet paper, you go for salt. Salt is an essential commodity. And it has always been, actually. Salt, what, what is it? I mean, what does it do? We know that we need it in our body makeup to, to function as human beings, but, but what was salt used for primarily throughout all of history? It was used as a preservative. It was used as a, an antiseptic. It was, a, it was a way to stop meat going through the process of putrefaction. Meat without salt rots, and it rots very quickly. Um, my family, well, I grew up on a farm uh, near Ballarat, and, um, and my grandmother used to speak about the times before electricity came to that farm, and she would talk about in the summer that they'd, they'd kill, they'd make a, a, a kill a lamb, they would hang up the meat in the cool safe, and she said, more often than I would like to remember, I'd open up that safe and discover in the summer that a fly had got in and that the, the carcass was full of maggots. And she'd say, I'd say, what did you do, Gran? And she said, oh, it's all right, we'd get the knife and without telling one, I'd cut off all the maggoty bits and serve it up. <laughs> Not the maggoty bits, the bits that weren't maggoty. <laughs> Even today, if you, if you like your beef jerky or your South, South African background and you love your biltong, you know that the only way you can eat meat that's been preserved is because it's had salt rubbed into it. Now, when Jesus speaks and he says, you, to this crowd, he says, you're the salt of the earth, there's an implication that's negative by that very positive statement, isn't there? And the negative implication is, is that the earth needs the salt. It's the earth is like meat. It's, it's subject to rottenness and putrefaction. It's subject to decay. Now, this is a... Some of us, maybe according to our inclination, go, yeah, of course it's subject to decay. Others of us, no, 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 it's not. And sometimes the political line divides on those ways. But 
the truth that Jesus teaches is, is that the earth is in need of salt and it's subject to decay. Um, I studied international relations for, for quite a period of my life and um, I remember studying about the period in the, uh, the years before the dawning of the 20th century, so in the late 1800s. And there was a very common um, group in political science and international relations. In fact, it was the predominant group by far. And they spoke about that the dawn of the 20th century was going to bring in a new period of enlightenment because the, the scientific advancements around the world, because of educational advances and economic growth and, and new ways of, of nations relating to each other, we were going to have a golden age. The world was going to get better and better and better. Well, the 20th century put a little bit of a dent in that view. Only a decade later, the beginning of the First World War, and then, of course, what happened in the rest of the 20th century, the bloodiest century in all of human history, bar none. It's true that our world is not as rotten as it could be, and that while Christians, like us, we mourn the rottenness in the world around us, there is a truth that this speaks to initially. Jesus speaks to, he says, the world is like meat that's getting rotten. You are the salt. You're the preservative. How do you relate to the world? Well, if you're a Christian, you are salt. You are a preservative. You are an antiseptic that stops things getting rotten. How do you relate to the world? You relate like you're salt. You're a preservative. And you say to me, well, Andrew, look, I'm just, I'm just little on me. How do, how do I act as a preservative in my world? And I'd say two ways. Firstly, though, simply by being just who you are. Nothing else. Just who you are as a Christian. If to any degree you reflect the character that Jesus describes for his people in the Sermon on the Mount, just by being who you are, you will act as a preservative. Let me give you an example. And you can contextualize this according to your own situation. But you know when you walk up to a group and you look at the group and there's the laughing or sometimes there's kind of the whispering and you know as you walk up to it that they're talking about something that they shouldn't be. If it's a group of men, let's be, let's be gender stereotypical here for a moment. If it's a group of men, they're probably talking dirty and crude about something you know, the sort of the laugh. If it's a group of women, they're probably gossiping about something. And you walk up to this group and the moment you arrive, you don't say anything, but suddenly the conversation ceases. There's a kind of this guilty, embarrassed look and, and, and the, to the, the topic changes or, or maybe they say, they say, oh, here's, here's the goody, goody girl or here's, you know, Mr. whatever it is, you know. And but you, often you don't have to say anything. You don't say anything. But the very fact that you are there as a Christian, as salt, it changes things. It changes the atmosphere in which you work and in which you live. And often you may not even be aware of it, but it's very true that, and I've spoken to people who've become Christians and they reflect on what it was like. And there was a Christian in their workplace maybe who, who had been salt and they were like, yeah, I, we used to laugh at that person. We used, to, we used to mock them, but they impacted me. So just by being who you are. But secondly, salt is also, it's not just a, a preservative, it, it's a preservative by being caustic. It's, it bites, it stings. And if you doubt me, the next time, if you've, got a, if you've got children or grandchildren, the next time your little boy or girl falls over and they skin their arm and you go, oh, grandma or dad's just got just the thing for this, and then, band-aid, band-aid, instead of the band-aid, you get the salt shaker and you shake it in and you rub it in and you go, that'll make you feel better. It hurts. Uh, salt stings. It's, it's, I'm not a scientist, but I presume it's somehow that's reaction what kills the germs. In, in the same way, how do you act as salt in your world? You, you act by being different to the point of stinging. I recently saw a, a beautiful film called A Hidden Life. It's a story of a, of a simple Austrian farmer who is living during the years of the Third Reich when Germany has taken over Austria. 
And this simple Austrian farmer looks at the world around him and he looks at the rottenness that he sees politically that's infiltrating right to the roots of his society and he grieves and he mourns. And he, but he doesn't just mourn and grieve, he is, his saltiness leads him to make a difference and to take a stand and he refuses to sign the oath of allegiance to Hitler. And this stings those around him. This bites those around him. Uh, it causes resentment and anger in his community towards him. He's, he's spoken of as a traitor. He's seen as evil. In the end, he's imprisoned. And then finally, the, oh, I'm going to spoil it for you. Well, it doesn't end well for him. In one sense, he loses all that he has to lose. But he's salty. Uh, I recently read another book about the, um, the history of our first peoples in Victoria. The Aboriginal people, and, and it fascinates me that in the 1800s, Christians were lambasted in the press for refusing to um, move away from the fact that the Bible says that we are one blood. We are all God's children because the prevailing wisdom, the scientific wisdom of social Darwinism that was prevalent at the time in academic and, and political circles said that no, 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 we are not different. We are not the same. We don't share one blood. These are, these are dinosaurs, evolutionary dinosaurs, and what you need to do is let them die out gracefully. And the Argus, which is the predecessor of today's Melbourne age, delighted in, in calling Christians featherweight philanthropists. For, for trying to, trying to, they employed a, um, a protectorate for Aboriginals. They, they argued against the excesses of the settlers on land grabs throughout this state. And for it, they were lambasted by their society. There was a rottenness which Christians stood up against that manifested in racism. And you think of those two examples and you, I hope, would lord those two groups of people. You would lord those like that, those Austrian farmer who stood up against Hitler. You would lord those Christians in Victoria who refused to see the Aboriginal First Peoples as just evolutionary dinosaurs, throwbacks, destined to die. And you look at that historically and you go, well, how could they have done anything else? They were the salt of the earth. They were preserving their culture against rottenness. But let me tell you, when the gale-forced winds blew against them of their culture when they were lambasted in the press, when they were ridiculed, when, when they were viewed as their actions as being evil, let me tell you it must have been for them an almost irresistible pressure to conform to the culture. Now we look and go, well, how could they have done anything else? But for them, being salt was a matter of being caustic. It was a matter of being different. different. It was a matter of, of biting, causing resentment even. And I want to tell you a couple of things. So too it is with our world in regards to gender. I'll let that sink in. The foolishness which surrounds the gender debate at the moment. It's foolishness. It's, it's, it's an expression of rottenness. So too it is with the sexual darkness where we're told that the live the sexual lifestyle that we're encouraged to is actually helping people. Really? Blessing children? Is it increasing sexual satisfaction? Is doing any of these things? But we're told and we can't argue against it because it's the force of the cultural wind is that this is not an issue that you can discuss or disagree with. And what about as we think of our state and we think about COVID and we think of the death counts we see every day from COVID? What about a state? What about a world that thinks nothing of the murder of innocent children in the womb? Those things I just said verge on cultural heresy, all three of them. Those things are, you just shouldn't say that. Those are the things, some of those things which the government in this state is moving to make illegal to say. But they're true. And one day, society will look back and go, how could Christians have said anything else? How, how could they have let this rottenness pervade and said nothing and I hope and pray they say they did say something, they did stand up, they were prepared to be salt in a world that is prone to corruption. And you say to me, well, Andrew, but that's not how you fix the world, by being that kind of salt. 
You, you, you just got to love people and you've got to be in society and you've got to be just working from within. You don't make pronouncements that actually hurt people or that, that cause people resentment. And I say to you, look at our world is what we're doing working. Look, look, at, look at Australia as a society, as a culture. According to the biblical standards, are we getting better all the time? Are we becoming more wholesome and more healthy according to what God reveals for human flourishing? Well, when the meat gets rotten, you don't blame the meat. That's what meat does. It, putrefaction is its natural tendency. It's its default setting. When the meat gets rotten, what do you blame? You blame the salt. Where is the salt? You and I are salt by just being who we are, but we're also salt by standing up for what is right. But we're preservative as we seek, and whether or not people listen to us ultimately doesn't even matter, but salt, by its very saltiness, stings and bites, and it proclaims that there is health and wholeness, but not in the direction that the world is going. But salt also flavours. And we live in a world that is bland. And it's interesting, multiple people over the years have commented on the fact that we, we think sin is so exciting and so flavoursome and so different, when in reality, sin is absolutely boring. Boring and bland and tasteless. It has a narrow appeal, but in the end, it, it brings the taste of ashes. It's tasteless. And salt is a preservative, yes, but salt also flavours. It savours. And the thing about salt is that as long as salt is in the salt shaker, it does no good to anything. The salt can sit on the shelf and make proclamations about the meat, can do it all it likes, but while it's still in the salt shaker, it does absolutely nothing. It's only when the salt goes into the meat that it does what it's needed to do. And it's the same with us as Christians. You know, we need to be salt, but we need to be in the world to be able to be effective as salt. We can never be a, a holy huddle. And in some senses, while I think monasticism achieved a lot, the idea of Christians huddling together in, in little self-sustaining communities and, and, and that, the, preserving themselves, I think good things have come out of that. But fundamentally, the salt needs to be in the meat if it's to do, his job, if it do its job. Christians, Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You need to flavor the world. You need to be in the meat. But he adds a warning in verse 13. Jesus says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men or under people's feet. This warning from Jesus would only need to have been spoken if his disciples, those who were listening to him, actually were in danger of becoming unsalty. Otherwise, why would he say it? But Jesus warns these people who he says, you're the salt of the earth, but if you lose your saltiness, then you're useless. You're just thrown out and, and trampled on. So if Jesus, we take him at his word, that means that you and I can lose our saltiness now. Then when we ask, how do we relate to the world out there? The answer is, you can relate in a way that is not salty. You can lose your saltiness and you can lose who you are as a Christian and you become worthless for the goal to which you have been created. So how do you lose your saltiness? Well, I think one way, there's a number of ways, but one way is clearly that we become like the meat to the extent that we have no influence on it. We, we become subject to the rottenness of the world around us. Well, this week, um, I, I don't watch a lot of TV, but this week, um, there was a, a Netflix thing Dana told me about, and it was going to appeal to two of my loves, archaeology and British history, and I know that's probably only me that has those two, two loves, but this was a film about um, an, an excavation, a dig in the 1930s that discovered an Anglo-Saxon longboat buried beneath a mound, and that sort of thing, well, that, that really interests me, and so I watched this film. And as I watched it, um, it, it, was, it was good. It had a good storyline. But then, then you got this obligatory themes of sexual immorality and homosexuality. 
And uh, I, we did some history. And apparently, none of it was there in history. They just had to insert it to make it palatable and to make it interesting to the society that we live in today. You have to have these kind of themes or it's not a real movie. Now, the reality is that every movie, every documentary, every media uh, clip, it has a purpose. It's telling you a story. It wants you to feel in a certain way, and it wants you to respond in a certain way. And Netflix and TV and movies, all of those things do it very deliberately. And the reality is these things flow from a culture which is subject to rottenness. Now, not every documentary or every movie or every TV show is, is subject to rottenness in the same way, but nearly all of them are tainted by that flow. So Christians are in the world, so in one sense there's nothing wrong with, with participating in a culture, even when it's not wholesome to some extent. We've got to be in the world. We, you know, uh, later on um, in, in Corinthians, I think it is, Paul says, look, if you're going to not associate with anybody that's sexually immoral, you're just not going to associate with anybody in the world. But also there is a point where we reach where we can soak ourselves in the rottenness of our culture, not to understand it or, or not to, I don't know, participate in it because we've got no choice, but because we enjoy it. And I, I didn't get to the end of that film I was watching. I, I, I got frustrated and I turned it off. It wasn't that bad. But I went upstairs and later that night, an image or a vision came into my mind and it was of a whole church. A church sitting in a church building but with IV drips in their arms. Eyes closed. Well, the drip goes into their arm. Not a saline drip, not a salty drip, but a drip feeding into the bloodstream, the rottenness of the culture. And then at the end, eyes open and we pull the drips out of our arm and we go into the world not even realising how impacted by the culture we have become. Not salty, but just like everybody else and unaware even of the rottenness of the direction our culture has head. If the salt loses its salt, it's worth nothing, Jesus says, to be thrown out. And as I think of that and I look back on history and I consider again those Jewish peasants and ask, was that how they changed their world? By coming so like the world that they were indistinguishable from it? Was that how the first Christians changed the Roman Empire? By coming so part of the Roman Empire that people would go, oh, they're just like us, let's become Christians. No. Those first Jewish Christians and those Christians that scattered throughout the Roman Empire... They were salt in their society and subject to 200 years plus of determined effort by the greatest empire the world has ever known to exterminate them. And the world failed. And it failed not because they became like the world, but because the world started to become like them. The rottenness was, was halted. There were changes that were made, social improvements, um, human freedoms, things that we enjoy today came from those first Christians and, and our call as we think, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus says, be salty because that's how you relate to the world in which I put you, salt. And secondly, in verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. This is no less shocking than you, you, you little group of Jewish peasants are the salt of the earth, than to say you are the light of the world. The light, there's exclusive nature. You and you alone are the light of the world. And this is even more shocking because Jesus says himself, I am the light of the world. Speaking about himself as God's beloved son, coming into the world with the, radiating the light of the glory of God to a world around him, shining with brilliant light to the dark world. And then Jesus says, you guys, you, you're the light of the world. And as we, we think about it, what it means to have the Holy Spirit and experience more of the Holy Spirit in our church, sometimes we just default to thinking it's all about spiritual gifts. It's all about um, using this gift and that gift for the benefit of the church. But that is actually secondary. The Holy Spirit fundamentally comes to live within his people to shine the glory of God into the world in which he lives. We live. 
the Holy Spirit's presence within us, God living within his people, means that we, in one sense, become divine. We experience, we participate in the divinity of the Godhead because God lives within us. We shine the light, and we need to shine the light because in verse 14, Jesus says, a city on a hill can't be hidden. A people that have the God, God himself living within them through the presence of the Holy Spirit cannot be the same as the world. They have the light of God and they need to shine that light. He says, you and you alone are the light of the world. Now, what does light do? We looked at what salt did. What does light do? Well, light comforts, doesn't it? It, it illuminates. One of my um, favorite thoughts of light actually is our New Year, uh, Christmas Eve midnight service here in the church. After that service, I've, I've gone outside and I've looked back in at the church. It's midnight, it's dark, and seeing the light gently shining out through the windows, streaming out through the windows. Uh, it conveys images of Christmas Eve, of silent night, of stars brightly shining, of light that's comforting and warm and offering peace in a world of so much dif- confusion. And light does that. When Jesus says, you're the light of the world, he says, you're going to shine light and hope. You're going to draw people towards light out of darkness. But being the light of the world is also more equivalent to tripping a trip flare. In my years in the army, you, you would, on your, around your defensive position, you would lay a wire between two trees connected to a, a flare. And if the wire is tripped, the flare explodes in light. And when it does, you see the people who are trying to sneak by in the darkness, you suddenly see them in absolute clarity. The light uh, exposes, it it shines. And when it does, some people are drawn to the light. Other people are repelled by it, they're pushed away. Jesus speaks about light in more detail in John 3, 19, and he says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The light exposes and the purpose of light itself is to shine. Jesus says, you don't light a light and put it under a cover. It's, it's stupid. A city on a hill, you, you don't try and hide it. You can't. When the light shines, it has to shine and it has to be revealed. It, it has to go out. And when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, he's saying to his disciples, you need to shine my light, the light of the Holy Spirit that was in you into, into the world. You cannot do anything else. But the truth is, you and I, we often try to, don't we? When I was 18, I was, I was a brand new Christian, been a Christian for less than a year. And I joined the army and I went uh, to, I went to Dun, uh, Adfer and Duntroon in Canberra and I was immersed into a culture which was overwhelming in its intensity. I was being broken down and turned into an army officer. It was painful and it was difficult and, and being a Christian didn't seem like it would be any help. I had enough trouble just getting by each day without getting another thing that I was singled out for besides my lack of proficiency in ironing and polishing and marching and everything else. And so what I did was I I went underground. I went, to use the common analogy in art society, I went into the closet. I hid because I was scared. And I, I literally put the light under a cover. And this is what I would do. I'd go through the day, and, and I kind of was flying under the radar. I wasn't doing anything overtly non-Christian, but when the talk got dirty and when, the, and, you know, when there was sexist comments and when there was this and that, and, and it was all you know, a very macho kind of environment at that time, I'd just got quiet. And at night, I'd get in my room after the lights out, and I'd get my masking tape, and I would tape the corners of the door because no light would go out into the corridor, And then just to make sure that no light was getting out, I'd get a blanket and I'd put it over my head and I would go underneath my desk and drape the the blanket around like a little tent and then I would take out my little torch and I'd open up my Bible and I would shine it and I would read it. 
I was literally hiding my light because I was scared. I knew that not everyone would go, oh, look, Andrew's shining his light, let's become a Christian. I knew that people would respond in different ways and, and some people would come against me, they'd persecute me. So I would do it that way until one day, as I was doing that, I read this passage. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. You don't put, light your light and put it under a covering. You, you, you take the light off so it gives light to everybody in the house. And I, I was reading this thinking, oh, Lord, I think you might be talking to me. Here, you know, with the masking cape on the doors and under my blanket in the darkness. And maybe that's you in your workplace. People wouldn't even know you're a Christian. Maybe it's you in your school. You're afraid to ask someone to youth group because you know that that would out you as being a Christian. And maybe it's true of you in your family dynamic. You don't want to speak about the fact that you're a Christian because you know that that's going to make people uncomfortable in your family. Maybe it's you in your professional workplace. You don't want to acknowledge being a Christian because you know it won't go well for your work that you're doing. Jesus says you can't. You're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. And that moment, I remember, I was like, all right, all right, all right, Lord, all right, all right. So I took the masking tape off the doors, and I, I got out from under the, the desk, and I put my Bible that I'd been reading, and I left it on my shelf. I said, I'm going to shine my light. That's all I'll do. I'll leave it on the shelf. But I knew what would happen. The next morning, as the inspection came through, the corporal picked it up and went, what the hell is this, Grills? It's a Bible corporal. Yeah, but what have you got it here for? So because I'm a Christian. <laughs> and it didn't suddenly get easy. In fact, it got a lot harder. But let me tell you, hiding your light as a Christian is miserable. You, know, you feel miserable. You, you, you can't enjoy the world that you're trying to mix in with. And you can't enjoy God who you, you're worshipping in secret. So you, and you've got the, the worst of both. Let your light shine. And that began for me a period that continues to this day of, of God's goodness shining into my life, a, a, a non-hypocritical acknowledgement that I am a man filled with the Holy Spirit and I need to shine the light into the world. Not perfectly, because I'm not Jesus, but I am one he called to shine his light to others. And what's the end result of salt and light? Well, as we move towards an end, Jesus says in verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So salt and light together, Jesus moves on. He says, they're going to see your good works and then they're going to praise God, not you. And Jesus says, that's what you're trying to do. That's the same as what um, it's talking about in Titus where it says, Jesus died to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. Uh, Ephesians 2 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. So, so what are good works? What are the good deeds that Jesus says should shine the light to the world and result in praise to God the Father? Well, John Stott, in this passage, he says this. He says, it seems that good works is a general expression to cover everything a Christian says and does because he's a Christian. Every outward and visible manifestation of his Christian faith. Your good works are when you sh share the good news about Jesus with someone in your workplace. That is a good work. Your good deeds include coming to a church service and participating with God's people in worship of him. Your good works include serving others within the Christian community. Your good works include showing up to GC when you don't feel like it. Your good works include giving your finances when you could use them for yourself, but to, the, to bless God and bless others. Those are good works. Your good works include sticking with a spouse and working through difficulties when you think, I'd just be so much easier to start again with somebody else. 
Your good works include, if you're a child, submitting to and obeying your parents. These are good works. But they're not exclusively what Jesus means. Remember, he says, everything that you do because of your Christian. John Stott goes on to say this. He says, indeed, the primary meaning of works must be practical. Visible deeds of compassion. It's when people see these, Jesus said, that they will glorify God, for they embody the good news of his love, which we proclaim. Without them, our gospel loses its credibility, and our God, his honor. The first Christians changed the world, not just by being salty, not just by shining the light. They they changed the world by their good deeds. As they were Christians, they they let that truth of the Holy Spirit's presence outwork in their lives that serve the poor and the marginalized, that care for those who were, were excluded by Roman society like orphans, like women, like slaves. And that changed the world. Today, I get so frustrated because it seems very often that the church is cut right in the middle. You've got those who who do the good deeds and you've got those who shine the light. Those who shine the light are saying, we live in a sinful cultural moment. We need to turn to Christ. We need to turn to the gospel. And if you don't, there's no hope for you on all of this earth except hell. You need to come and believe. But too often they, they, they proclaim it from their pulpits and, and from their churches, but there's no service of the world in which they live. And then on the other side, you've got people who go, it's all about practically helping people. It's serving the poor. It's running soup kitchens. It's, it, it's reaching out into hard places. It's, it's being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. But they don't proclaim the news of Jesus Christ, the light. There, there seems to be this dichotomy in the middle. And I think when I read the Bible, Jesus says you need to do both. You need to be both. When you relate to the world, you need to proclaim the light, even if it makes you unpopular, and you need to serve the same people that are are even persecuting you. Salt and light, and when the synergy comes together in that, there's a power, a power for change. I said I was going to share goals. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be a spoiler to my own sharing with you of the goals that God has laid on a heart, but let me Let me tell you that one of these, the key one of these this year, is that we do better at that act. We really go after making a difference in our city to those who are poor, marginalised, excluded. It matters. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. When Jesus spoke those words, it seemed so laughable that a group of Jewish peasants would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But Jesus wasn't laughing. And when we look at ourselves and our weaknesses, and we hear these same words of Jesus, you, sitting on a hill, Geelong, are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus is not smiling now either. He's given us a big, beautiful answer to that question of what does it look like to be a Christian in the world? What does it look like for us to be a church in the world? He says, you're going to be salt and you're going to be light and you are going to do good deeds, good works that result in praise to our Father in heaven. So as the band come up and we we close out our time together this morning, I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to pray that these words would sink right into our hearts deeply. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you use the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Thank you that you use the things that are not to shame things that are. Thank you that you looked at those Jewish peasants gathered on that mountain long ago, Jesus. Thank you that you looked at them and you saw what they would be, salt of the earth and light of the world. And Lord, we today are no different. We are the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. Lord, give us boldness. Give us courage to stand up as salt, to be caustic even and bitter to a world around us. Help us to be preserving preserving this world. Help us to stop its rottenness. Help us to proclaim the truth. And Lord, we pray, help us to shine the light. And all of this, Lord, help us to be a people that is eager for good works 
Help us to be a people who does the works which you prepared for us to do before the beginning of time. And as we do that, Lord, may we indeed be your people in the world which needs you so desperately. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.